welcome to Potter Revisited, episode 38. Today we are jumping into Prisoner of Azkaban, starting with chapter 1, Apple Post. Or, as we like to call it, Tickled at the Stake. Just to open up with, I just wanted to talk a bit about, you know, our general thoughts about Prisoner of Azkaban. I know I've, I've said the last few episodes that this was the first book I read, so I'm very excited for how nostalgic this is going to be for me. First Harry Potter book or first book ever? This is the first Harry Potter book I read. So I, 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 Philosopher's Stone was our class novel in my third grade, but I didn't read it. It was read to us by our teacher. And I saw the first two movies in theaters, but I was 10 in when I read this. So I was about, about 2004. But this originally came out in 1999. So it's been around a while. But we bought the earlier books, I guess, around the time the movies came out. And one day I was cleaning my room and I found it. And I was like, instead of cleaning... I'm just going to read this book. Anything's better than cleaning. Mom can't get mad at me because I'm reading. And then I ended up getting really hooked into it. And that was the end for me. <laughs> yeah, but originally it came out in 1999, which is crazy to me. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, like, we, we were already alive when it happened, but we were young. We were very young. Like I said, I didn't read this to, I didn't read this to about 2004 when I was in the fourth grade. So like, it was quite a couple of years went by since this came out. But I do think that this was probably one of my favorite books because the characters were in the book are they're a lot older. This book is a lot of growing pains and just kind of like they're almost entering like that yeah. early teenagehood. And I felt I could really relate to it, especially with all like the fights and stuff that happened between Ron, Hermione, and Harry in this book. I very vividly remember reading this book over the course of having a huge follow with my friends in the fourth grade. And I think that's why this is really nostalgic to me because I can just so painfully relate to Hermione of having no friends and being so lonely. So probably to get into that trauma more when we get to there in the book. But I definitely love seeing just like how this is obviously where the series gets a bit more dark. And so I just love to see like that it slowly transitions us into the characters are older, there's more things are what things are priority, they're less innocent and just how everything develops from there. Yeah, I feel like the second book expanded on the wizarding world, like sort of geographically and it's showing us like, there's more than just Hogwarts. There's like places and people outside of Hogwarts and things like that, like expanded the world. But I think this book expands the world in time sort of. So instead of just saying like, this is what wizarding life is now in all these places, it's saying this is also how wizards lived before because we get a bit more on wizard history a little bit, but also so much just of the earlier generation, which is a good job of sort of like making it feel more permanent and real and having a history and a present and it having a past, I guess. It sets it in time more. Interesting you mentioned time because looking at the time churner is going to be one of the interesting points in the novel because I generally don't like time travel as a concept in most mediums. Like, except in Doctor Who, where it's the point. It usually doesn't. Yeah, it's just never done very well, and I feel it opens up a lot more plot holes. So we will see how this holds up. It'll be fine. There's nothing wrong with time travel. It's never caused any inconsistencies in anything ever. Of course not. Not ever, Tori. We open up Prisoner of Azkaban, as we did at Chamber of Secrets, where Harry's just, you know, experiencing who Harry is. He's a wizard who his friends are just it summarizes the last two books and like what kind of happens yeah it, it does the important things right this is harry his name is harry potter hello kids don't forget harry's a wizard also his best friend ron has red hair and hermione granger is so smart yeah i do fi find that a lot of children's series generally do do recaps like this because children don't obviously read things in order and it worked out for me because i did not read this in order <laughs> Good thing they thought ahead for you. Yeah, but I feel like it's pretty consistent up until maybe Order of the Phoenix, because I do think that they have a little bit of a summary in Goblet of Fire. But I think by then, like, it's kind of less children's genre and more general fantasy. So it kind of ages out as you get further in the series. Yeah, it allows you to be a bit more of a grown-up and expects more of you as a reader. Yeah, and we open up with Harry doing his homework in the middle of the night under his covers. I mean, don't we all... Okay, no, not my homework, but I definitely was one of those... They're not homework. Yeah, I was one of those under-the-cover readers growing up, for sure, sneaking my book. I used to, like, I wasn't a bad kid, because, like, the worst thing I did was I would just stay up late and read 
past my bedtime and my parents used to get so mad at me because to be like inconspicuous and not like alert them that I was doing this, I wouldn't turn the light on when I was reading. So I'd be reading sometimes without my glasses in the dark and when my parents caught me they get really mad because I was gonna ruin my eyes. But I mean, I feel like they're already <laughs> ruined. We weren't made for seeing things well. We were made to sustain the glasses industry. But I also do remember I would pretend to go to the washroom or to get a glass of water and I'd just lock myself in the bathroom and like be reading for like half an hour. And my mom always knew when I was doing it too because she'd always catch me. Yeah, that's moms for you. They know too much. They see too much. I used to get in trouble for reading in class all the time in school. They'd be like, you're supposed to be paying attention to like math. And I was like, yeah, but math is boring and this is awesome. But we have Harry doing some summer homework, which we've discussed um, when we did uh, Chamber of Secrets, that it's a bit odd that they have homework over the summer holidays. A bit cruel. I mean, like, I understand the concept of like, you want, don't want them to forget things they learned, give them a bit of a refresher. I, I kind of get it in concept, but when you think of magic and how a significant portion of their students don't have magical parents at home, like, what if you have questions? You have no one to reach out to for help with your homework if it's difficult. Furthermore, in Harry's circumstance, which Albus Dumbledore, for one, is keenly aware of, he's abused, A, which makes it hard to focus and learn things, but also they take away his school books and they lock them away. So, like, it's in no way Harry's fault if he can't get his homework done and yet he'd still be held to the same standards as everybody else. And that just seems incredibly wrong to me. Yeah, and it's definitely, we did talk about how it's kind of odd that they do this and, like, the kind of work they assign. Because before, they weren't really referencing what kind of work they were doing, but Harry is discussing writing multiple essays for multiple different classes, which feels like a lot more like in depth, like than just something to like review the subjects before the next year's school, which is I would I would think would be fair. Yeah, it just it gets harder. Yeah, which is harder. You have to like read your textbooks and you're citing like essays, and it's a lot of work. And I'm wondering if it's done because they need to make up for all the coursework they didn't do during Chamber of Secrets. Oh, interesting. Which we've talked about in depth, or because Harry's entering the third year, maybe that's they assign more work to exiting second year, so they'll be more prepared for a bigger co course load. But it definitely seems like a lot of work for the summer without any instruction, like you said. I mean, I guess it depends. Like, I always get confused when they say, like, oh, Hermione did hers two times the parchment that it was supposed to be. Like, I don't know if they mean, like, like, is a piece of, piece of parchment, like, a piece of paper? Because that so it's supposed to be a two-page essay? Because, like, I could write a couple two-page essays over the summer and be fine, like, even at that age. It's not so bad. But I also don't know if, how long a parchment is or if they mean like that many parchment pages thick. <laughs> like I have no way of sort of knowing. It's hard to know because parchment rolls up. So I don't know like yeah. how thick it's supposed it... to be. I do remember they do talk about essays like they're measuring them with measuring tape, which is interesting. Yeah, like a foot and a half long or something. I'm like, okay, that's like two pages max. That's not crazy for a 13 year old. I don't know. I just, we don't have any experience with summer over the, under, like, over the school year, like, even in the summer, which seems so, like, completely off to me. Yeah. Like, having to do an essay in the middle of the summer holidays. I mean, like, my mom used to make me do homework over the summers just for, like, I don't know, because she wanted me to. Yeah, I think generally most kids maybe would in, like, some, like, review packets. I did especially, like, I did like some just like general math stuff because I was not good at math and it was supposed to keep me, you know, keep it in my brain. But uh, Harry is reading this like part of his history book where it has a take that witch burning wasn't actually painful or lethal for witches and wizards. They would just cast like a charm and it would tickle them and then they disapparate so they wouldn't even die. And it got me thinking that the whole point of like the side of the pure blood not wanting like Mug not liking muggles and wanting to like take over the muggles and put them in their place is because in history it's that muggles have like basically murdered witches and wizards because they have witchcraft which was bad to them but if that doesn't happen then like what's the history that it's based off of I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that, like, even if they didn't actually effectively kill wizards and witches, they were persecuted, they were sought out, like, and muggles tried to kill them. So, like, the intent matters a little bit, I guess. Like, they wanted us all dead. That's pretty horrendous. Yeah, I guess. And, like, I guess if they continue to know about us, they might get better at killing us. Um, then there's also, like, we don't know, like, who assigned this textbook. We don't know, like, what the, like, 
opinion of it is like history is written slightly different by different people like maybe the person who wrote this didn't personally know any wizards or witches who actually got killed during the persecution and the witch trials but that doesn't mean that there weren't any so like just this author's take is oh it's fine nobody died but if you ask a different author they'll be like no i knew people like i mean we don't know who wrote this textbook are they a historian were they just an old guy did they specialize in the witch trials who knows uh, but I also think when we talk about the witch trials like that, do we think any of the actual witches and wizards intervened at any point when muggles were falsely accused of witchcraft? Because people did die, like, historically during the witch trials. So That's why it's a weird take, I think. Like, I, it's definitely... You gotta think that, like, the wizards just, like, let people burn each other alive like that's not cool like a uh, rather us than them kind of thing yeah it's very an odd take because i get it's more child friendly being like oh and it's kind of like funny being like oh it doesn't actually hurt it just tickles them but like it's based off history and so i feel like there's already death in harry potter i don't think it's that history is win written by the winners as they say or whatever so Maybe the wizards were embarrassed that some of them actually got killed by muggles. I don't know. But I agree. It's it's like, it's not the same information we've gotten from other sources. So it could easily be political on both ends. Either the author being like, no, no, no one died. It was great. Versus the, what we get from like the Slytherin bad guys is like the, they were the worst and we all died. And it was the worst times that ever happened. It could just be a little bit of like where people stood. Because the pureblood families pay so much attention to their lineage, like they look at family trees so often, they probably do have the ability to look back at their family tree and say, my great-great-uncle Augustus was killed by muggles during the witch trials. This is what happened to him. But maybe some of the other people, because like, I don't know who my great-great-grandparents were. It's not really a top concern of mine. Other families that didn't pay that much attention to historical lineage didn't have like an emotional investment in what happened because they can't like put a name and a face to the victims yeah it's just it's just some like off like handed just like little paragraph but like reading it again it makes you think like of like the whole concept of this like whole argument that we've been seeing from like the bad guys in the series and it just made me think about like well where did this start from yeah i mean you gotta think it wasn't just all laughter and joking for witches and wizards. Like, maybe that's the kind of thing that, like, the author thought would seem cute and fun. So, like, when young kids are reading this book and they think, oh, yeah, the witch trials. Oh, no, we like witches and wizards now. And they were all killed. She could be like, no, 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 they weren't. It was fun for them. They had a great time. It just tickled. Yeah, it's like the concept was too mature for the reader. So they changed it to make it less bad sounding well in harry's you know summary of his life he mentions his friends ron and hermione and so at the end of chamber of secrets he gave ron and hermione the jersey's phone number and who of course decides to call him like a few days after term ends it's ron but ron doesn't know how to use a telephone so he's yelling and i love the scene where uncle vernon picks up and he's so like prevent proper he's like Dur vernon dursley speaking and ron's just like screaming into the receiver I want to speak to Harry Potter! Hello? Can you hear me? And it's funny because that's how he talks into the phone as a wizard whose parents have never used the phone and who personally has never used the phone and probably hasn't seen anyone use a phone. But it's funny because that's also often how, like, my mom talks on the phone when she's using it, the wireless in the car or something. But I'm wondering, like, what did Harry expect? Because I feel like this is a disaster no matter what. Yeah, I think... He probably didn't think it through. Like, it's probably, like, heartwarming end of the year, hugs, your friends. Like, oh, don't forget to write to me. Well, I do think he just mentioned that he doesn't want to have, like, a terrible year. Like, his, the previous summer where Dobby was taking the letters that Ron and Hermione wrote. So he wanted contact with them. And he's like, well, I can't let Hedwig out. So here's my phone number. But I feel like, yeah, he didn't think it through. I mean, like, it makes sense. Like, I could see an 11-year-old being like, how can they reach me? Oh, the phone. This is my phone. Like, that's how you reach me. That's like the way that I'm reached. So, and then not thinking through the, the Ron and the wizard of it all. But I do think like a little bit of forethought, like, hey, don't shout or don't say, hey, I'm a friend of Harry's from school. Well, Harry had more faith. I think Mr. Weasley, apparently he taught him how to use a telephone over the summer when he's at the borough. And he told Ron that his dad knew how to use it. But I don't think Mr. Weasley really knew how to use it. <laughs> 
But my other thought was, why didn't Harry give, tell Hermione to try and call first? I feel like this bit should have been pre-planned because Harry does reference that Hermione would have known better not to show and probably just say that she wasn't from Hogwarts. Yeah. So she would have had like a better handle on it. And then once Hermione knows how. It's just the level of forethought that 13-year-old Gryffindors don't necessarily have. Harry doesn't think things through. He doesn't plan things. But anyway, you have a little question here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think this is fun. We're talking about wizards trying to use the phone and stuff. And I was wondering, what muggle technology do you think wizards would think is the absolute most useless and stupidest thing? Because I personally think, like, escalators are pretty dumb when you think about it. Like, they're just stairs, but then they put in all this energy to make them electric and make them move. But, like, just go upstairs. I feel like I could see wizards finding that real stupid. Um, also a little bit electric kettles because electric kettles to say no more, I think. Oh, blow dryers. Like, I feel like there's magic spells that are really easy for things like drying your hair. So the existence of a blow dryer, how loud it is and how long it takes to dry your hair would probably be the most obnoxious thing ever to wizard. Yeah, I do feel like wizards have all of this, like they have spells to do like very simple things like normally like they can pull things towards them with the summoning spell and they can apparate and disapparate. So I feel like anything electric doesn't make sense to them. and But there's also the fact that despite wizards having all of this like magic to do things, they haven't advanced in technology, as we see from like little bits in the book, like how the kids at Hogwarts are in a castle and they're writing things with ink and, and quills and they don't have telephones because they can just use the flu network. And it's just like they don't advance things. Never once does Ron pull out a Casio scientific calculator and try and spell boobs and then show Harry. Never once and that's how yeah, you know. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like a lot of things they just don't think of because I feel like if with kettles they would just like put it on the burner on the stove, like an old fashioned kettle. Or just wave their wand and heat the water up. To have to wait, they'd be so annoyed. They'd be like, you have to wait? How long? It's very interesting to see like I feel like most electric things or even just like transportation, they don't really see the point of because they can do those things like they have a substitution for it. Yeah. I think another one, sort of on the opposite end, a technology that would blow their minds is fax machines. Like, you type this in here and it, like, prints out on actual paper there. Like, how does it travel so fast? Like, I think that would absolutely blow their minds. It kind of blows my mind and I'm... The funniest thing is seeing, like, uh, how the internet has become such like an institution to us so that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of memes online of people being like, what happens when, like, you know like 21st century, like Gen Z, like Muggleborns go to Hogwarts and they have no Wi-Fi. Like, what do you do? You do everything with Wi-Fi. <laughs> like, what do you do when you don't have an internet connection? So I just feel like these came out in the 90s. So we still had the internet, but it wasn't as accessible because you still had to have... Yeah, it wasn't like phones in our pockets. Yeah, you didn't have smartphones. So you just got the internet through the telephone line. So it was very much like a process. But now everyone has access to the internet, like at all times, pretty much. So it's something that you use every day. They'd probably just have like one old dusty desktop computer in the library that students can use to email their parents. Yes. <laughs> so there's this line that uh, when Harry is discussing like all the previous birthdays he had and how kind of terrible they were, all the Voldemort stuff that's happened to him. He's like, Harry had to admit he was lucky to reach his 13th birthday. And that just screams like, yikes to me. Like we talk about Harry's concept of death. I mean, yeah, he was almost murdered at one Almost murdered at 11, almost murdered at 12. He's Harry's constantly ready to die. <laughs> yeah, he's always on the edge. I would wonder what he would be charged for life insurance. So the fact that he's like happy that he's alive right now, it's just crazy. But he has actually a decent birthday in this chapter because, um, as you say, poor Errol in the notes, um, Hedwig and another bird are supporting unconscious Errol as they fly into Harry's window. Which is amazing. <laughs> Sad, that bird. I understand the Weasleys can't afford another bird right now, but maybe that should have been one of the luxuries they purchased when they won the lottery. Maybe a new bird so Errol can... I think Ron does mention he's not supposed to carry big packages, but I feel like that's the point of having an owl. Because like, they only have Errol as their family owl, and then Percy has his own owl. But they say Her Errol's not supposed to be, you know carrying big packages because what Her what Ron sends him he sends him a birthday parcel so he has a birthday card from Ron which one part of it is a clipping from the Daily Prophet which shows that the Weasleys won the Daily Prophet's like yearly lottery draw so they won the lottery which is perfect for the Weasleys no one deserves it more yeah 
And they went to Egypt to see Bill, all of them. And I thought it was actually a really good idea that they took a family vacation because as we spoke about at the end of like our Chamber of Secrets read through, Ginny has been through a lot the last year. And I feel like they didn't really address any of the drama or and its emotional or physical effects on her at the end of Chamber of Secrets. She just got told to have a hot chocolate and go to bed. So hopefully, hopefully they're uh, taking good care of her. Yeah, she needs some time off. It does sound like they're keeping her out of the more morbid tombs, so it looks like they're at least trying to consider her mental well-being. And I think it's nice sometimes to, like, when you've been through something so traumatic to, like, leave, like, you go you go away to take a break from it all. So just kind of getting out of England or wherever the Weasleys are located. But, uh, yeah, they, they spent most of their money on the vacation, which understandable. And then they bought a few of things that were, like, essentials and very important. Like a new frickin' wand for Ron. A new Ron for wand, yay! <laughs> you said Ron for wand. Ron for wand. <laughs> it's been, it's been a day. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a, a, a month. I wondered, I have some questions about, like, wizard vacations and wizard travel. Because, like, I feel like... If I were planning to travel abroad, the most expensive part would be, like, the flight. So I wonder if traveling is a lot more accessible and affordable for wizards because they don't have to fly. Like, they can take flu powder, they can apparate, or if it's farther, they can use a port key. Well, I don't know, because it, it brings up the idea of, like, how do you travel internationally? Because I could see flu powder working, like, in the in England or in the UK, but to go over to Egypt, that's like going into international like international travel. So I'm sure within England, it's kind of like here where it's you can kind of travel within the country, but there's different rules. Yeah, or maybe like within the European Union, it's pretty open travel wise. But I mean, even then though, you can like port key to a port key at a border, go through customs, and then port key to your hotel. You know what I mean? Like it's just there's so many shortcuts for travel. That would save them so much money. I feel like they probably charge for the, the port keys to be set up. Like, it's kind of like international flights. Like, instead of doing a flight, they're doing port keys instead. So I'm assuming that's kind of a fee as yes. well. And then also, I wondered... And there's, yeah, they're staying there for a month, yeah, too. Yeah, because so. then my other question was sort of like, if you travel in the wizarding world, if you can apparate, can you just, like, stay at home and then spend the day traveling around Egypt and then apparate home and go to your bed and then... I don't think apparation works, like, over, like a certain like I think don't think you can operate like that far I think I would take a lot out of you like I think there would be a physical toll if you tried to operate to like if like we're in Canada and we try to operate to the UK right now I'm 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 sure that would be like a physical toll because when we see them they're only operating within like England yeah okay and so I, mean, I don't think they're doing like super crazy distances but like it's still within like one area so I feel like the further you try to operate, like the more physical toll it puts on you. Because when Harry describes apparition, it seems kind of painful. Yeah. So if, and it's also like it can go really wrong. So I feel like it's like you, you should only try and apparate like within like a few hours or whatever of yourself. Okay, so basically, it's wizarding travel and vacation would be a lot like muggle travel. The only exception being instead of planes, they're replacing it with magical travel. Okay, all right, that was my curiosity my question oh yeah we have also find out that percy's head boy and ron doesn't seem excited which i feel kind of sad for percy because we know that he does all he gets all these accomplishments because he wants a better life for himself and also but he mostly does it just to have praise like his parents are proud of him but i just feel it's kind of sad that like none of his siblings see i know that percy's annoying and he's probably just like boasting about it but i think that like this is the only thing that he really has going for him yeah this is like the only thing he cares about and no one really cares. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure a lot of people care, just not Ron. Like I feel like Ron is always kind of at odds with Percy and his response to anything with Percy is always going to be like how annoying it is, especially that you know Percy talked about it nonstop. They're in Egypt and there's cool things and sites and Percy's like, well, as a prefect, like I'm sure it is the most obnoxious, but I feel like especially at that age and with that many siblings, it's probably like, like snarkiness and humor is probably the default response to anything that happens for your siblings because like it would be too much to be emotionally invested in all of their lives I think like to be like really like happy for them with them when they get something great and then really sad for them when something bad happens like I feel like that's a big emotional tool if you have that many siblings you gotta like pick and choose which ones you're fully invested in emotionally I think it's also the age difference too too because Ron idolizes Bill who was also a head boy and a prefect but because he's so much older, it's like he, 
he just idolizes him. Like, there's, like, they don't have, like, a super close relationship where, like, they're very close in age, so they relate to a lot of stuff. It's just he looks up to Bill. Yeah. And Percy's a few years older than him, but I feel like because the twins are kind of closer to Ron in age, they uh, have more in common. Yeah. It's it's hard to be Percy. It's like we just talk a lot about how Percy's just kind of ostracized from his family from the get-go. He's just, he's kind of the odd one out. So I just kind of, he lists that he's head boy and it's like this one big thing and I feel like only his... um parents really care yeah but i get like a big family it's like if one person gets something it's kind of like they're getting the attention that someone else isn't getting and we do know how ron feels about just being kind of overshadowed in his family so yeah i think it's a little bit insecurities a little bit like percy's annoying but uh hedwig apparently goes to where hermione's staying in france to get harry his present that she just somehow knew that hermione was getting for him hedwig is such a good bird like then she goes to Hagrid like she just really really knows what Harry needs emotionally and she makes sure he gets it and that is so much like such a wonderful thing for like like that's what pets are for you know like my dogs never went to someone's house to bring me back presents because she's a slacker but I like to think (laughs) at heart she wishes she could I also like to think Hedwig took some time in France you know he got himself a nice cheese plate had some nice red wine really luxuriated with some beautiful birds saw the Eiffel Tower she really yeah she had a good time on her way to pick up Harry's birthday present she was in no rush so Hermione gets him a broomstick servicing kit which Harry's really surprised by because he references seeing how heavy the package is that he thinks it's a book which kind of is weird to me because Hermione's gotten Harry and Ron pretty much the same thing the last two the last two Christmases that she get, that usually gets some like chocolate or like some kind of candy or something something pretty generic but something she knows that they'll like but this is the first gift she gets that's very personal like it's really directed to something she knows Harry's interested in and that he'll actually use and I think it kind of shows like how close they are as friends right now that she like strayed from like a very typical not very personalized gift to something very personalized that she'll know he likes. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the development of their friendship and also like how confident she is in what she knows about them. Because I feel like chocolates and candy are such a generic gift. Like you get the person you least know for Secret Santa and you're like, oh, I'll just get them chocolates and that's fine. Yeah, because everyone likes that and it's fine. Hermione not only was smart enough to know what Harry liked, but she was smart enough to keep in mind that like, what she likes isn't what he likes because I feel like when you're younger a problem you might have a gift is like I don't know what to get my friend I like this thing I wish I had this thing so I'm gonna get them that because it's what I want but like Hermione would have no interest in a broom cleaning kit so it's a little bit about like her maturity for a 13 year old I would say to say Harry likes these things even though I don't and then also on top of it not just getting him like a Quidditch figurine but getting him something that's actually kind of like practical like there's a lot of like a lot you can get from Hermione's character by the fact that that's the gift she gets Harry. Yeah, she's a very practical character. And it also kind of makes me sad because we know that in this book, like, Hermione has a falling out of Harry and Ron and then also Ron. And it just feels like she puts all the, she puts like a lot of effort into this gift. And, like, we can kind of see, like, how much she cares about them. And just knowing that it all kind of comes back, like, on her face or whatever. Yeah, it's a, it's a rough book for Hermione. For Hermione. And Hagrid also sends a gift. <laughs> That's uh, questionable. Oh boy. I think Harry references that Hagrid would never send him something dangerous on purpose. Yeah, that's exactly. That's how I felt when they thought he was the one who opened the Chamber of Secrets. I was like, not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never on purpose. It's just Hagrid. So Hagrid sends Harry the Monster Book of Monsters, which we know is a textbook he needs for class next year. But, um... Maybe he should have bound it. Literally any other person in the entire series would have put a sticky note on the wrapping like caution, slightly dangerous, do not open or like open cautiously, you know, not just. Or maybe Hagrid should have sent it, send it bound. Yeah. Because it literally tried to eat him. Oh, it tried Harry's to kill Harry Potter. Off. <laughs> and of course, Harry's like opening it in the middle of the night when the Dursleys are sleeping. So he's like trying not to make noise as he tries to like stamp this like. It's Dobby all over again. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> yeah, but Harry Hagrid sending a biting book is very on brand for him. I'm not surprised. Yeah, and I'm just thinking at the end of this chapter, it's kind of a short chapter, as we're just kind of summarizing the events of the last two books and establishing Harry and his friends and how everything goes but uh harry's like actually quite happy with his birthday it's his first time he got birthday cards and like presents 
but it's actually seems like quite a somber birthday for 13. I remember 13 being like a really exciting age term because you're technically a teenager and it's like the in-between phase of like leaving childhood behind and becoming more adult and mature. But all Harry really did is spend his 13th birthday alone by himself when he got sent presents from a few friends. Like he didn't have a party or really celebrate with anyone and it's like a big milestone birthday it's like one of those birthdays kind of like 16 like where it's like a big number and it should feel really important and he's just kind of a uh, by himself but on his scale of birthdays it's, it's a good birthday but i just feel like this is all yeah which says a lot about the life he's lived yeah this is all dumbledore's fault <laughs> yeah this is entirely dumbledore's fault first of all dumbledore doesn't send him a gift or anything knowing his circumstances that's a dick move especially being the one that enforced him being there like dick move times a thousand also like if dumbledore were remotely concerned about harry's emotional and psychological well-being he he would like occasionally threaten the dursleys into being better like we get that very very late in the series but like it seems a little bit like he dropped the ball well he only threatens them because they were going to kick harry out as long as he doesn't care what they do as long as he yeah it's only harry's physical life that he cares about not his emotional well-being and like to me as a remotely decent human being albus dumbledore should send them a threatening letter like on harry's birthday he's going to london to see his friends don't fuck this up that would have been a great present and Dumbledore doesn't care at this point in the series. He's just like, this guy has to be alive and come to school. That's all that matters. As long as the heart is beating, I have succeeded. As long as he's physically at school and still alive, that's all that matters to Dumbledore at this point. He's just kind of like checking up his list. He's just trying to drag Harry's not yet a corpse across a specific finish line. And that's it. Like nothing <laughs> else matters. Yeah, that's pretty much the chapter. We don't get into anything really juicy until next chapter. But do you have any overall thoughts or comments before we sign off um overall thoughts and comments not enough snape of course it's a problem that i find in all of these chapters where he's stuck at the dursleys yeah shay was very excited for this book because she wants more snape so we'll see how that goes yeah i'm just very excited to see the Ugh, aunt marge next her. chapter and to see how awful that's gonna be it's gonna be like those awkward family dinners with relatives you don't like yeah, so thank you much for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited. And we will be back next time to discuss Chapter 2 of Prisoner of Azkaban and Marge's big mistake. You can reach us for any comments or theories or anything you'd like to discuss with us or the podcast at Potter Revisited on social media or Potter Revisited Podcast at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.